Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Thiamine is a B vitamin. It's one of the B vitamin complex. It's dubbed vitamin B1. Now it's involved with many important activities of the human body, creating energy out of the sugar in your food, blood sugar control, the health of your heart, the health of your nerves, and the health of your brain. Issues with the ability to utilize thiamine are connected with diabetes, heart damage, severe memory issues, and nerve damage. A form of thiamine called benfothiamine can be helpful for those issues. So today I'm going to address the effects of benfothiamine on the brain and for memory issues. So hello. My name is Jerry Hickey. I'm a nutritional pharmacist. I'm also the chief scientific officer over here at Invite Health. And welcome to our episode, This Vitamin for Memory Loss. Some elderly people have a risk for developing problems with utilizing vitamin B1, subclinical thiamine deficiency. And the thing is, this could be related to a a poor diet. A lot of elderly people who live alone they're not exactly eating in a healthy way. Uh, but it could also be related to the absorption of thiamine. They're having problems absorbing thiamine from their food. Uh, alcohol messes with your thiamine, so alcoholics have terrible diseases of the brain um, related to B1. And um, many health conditions and some drugs also affect the ability of the elderly to utilize thiamine. So a very poor ability to utilize thiamine or lacking thiamine is related to uh, dementias like uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. You see this in uh, alcoholics. But also now they're finding a strong connection with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, um, in diabetes, they're connecting diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, In diabetes, diabetics cannot fully utilize blood sugar for energy. They can't utilize the sugar in their blood for energy, and they can't effectively control the level of sugar in their blood, which leads to all kinds of problems, and many problems with the brain. So some researchers are referring to Alzheimer's disease as diabetes of the brain. Just like a diabetic cannot use sugar for energy, in people with Alzheimer's disease, their brain cannot use vitamin B1, and the inability to utilize vitamin B1 leads to poor ability to use sugar in the brain for energy. And sugar is the number one source of energy for your brain. It's not protein, it's not fats, it's sugar. Your, your brain lives on sugar. So there's been studies showing this. They were using PET scans, very powerful imaging tools of the brain. And the researchers found that Alzheimer's patients have poor ability to metabolize sugar in their brains. They just have poor ability to use glucose in their brain. A very large PET study, you know, using PET scans, 822 people over the age of 55. Now, this was performed at multiple institutions, so there's a lot of doctors and researchers involved. They found a connection between the degree of issues with sugar metabolism in the brain with the degree of cognitive impairment in the patients with Alzheimer's disease. So they found that in people with memory issues, the worse the ability to use sugar for energy in their brain, the worse the loss of memory functions and cognitive functions. Now, in the study, compared to people with healthy brain function, those with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease had worsening sugar metabolism in their brain. So mild cognitive impairment is the brain has shrunk somewhat, you're you're just not understanding complex instructions, your memory is suffering. The problem is this leads to Alzheimer's disease in most sufferers. About 80% of people with mild cognitive impairment will progress into full-blown Alzheimer's disease. So they found that the level of inability to utilize um, sugar in the brain in those with mild cognitive impairment could actually forecast when they might convert into Alzheimer's disease. So the worse their ability to use sugar, 
the more likely they were going to drift into Alzheimer's disease. So there was a nine-year-long study of people over the age of 55, and that connected having diabetes, diabetes mellitus, you know, type 2 diabetes, to an increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of things that go wrong in the brain in people with diabetes. They also find a reduction in vitamin B1, that's thiamine, dependent activities, pathways in the brain, enzymes in the brain that depend on vitamin B1 for their activities, related to altered sugar metabolism in, in, in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So they can't use vitamin B1 properly, they can't use sugar properly, and they get worsening Alzheimer's disease. So there was a case control study in 38 elderly women, a small study. Blood levels of thiamine and its metabolites, those are the things it converts into for different pathways so it can make those pathways work properly, were lower in those with Alzheimer's disease type dementia. Now, they did post-mortem studies of patients who died from Alzheimer's. It's not just that they had Alzheimer's, they died from Alzheimer's. So they did post-mortem studies of their brains and they found decreased thiamine activity. Like there's enzymes like alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and transketolase that are, in, that are involved with healing and energy production and metabolism, et cetera. And these were just lacking in the brains of people who died with Alzheimer's disease. So all of this evidence adds to the scenario that there's something about thiamine and severe memory loss. Adding uh, benfotiamine, that's a thiamine derivative, to the chow of mice with the rodent, rodent version of Alzheimer's disease alleviated cognitive alterations and decreased the number of beta amyloid plaques in their brains. Now, before we go any further, researchers cure Alzheimer's disease in mice every other month. There's many things that help mice with Alzheimer's disease. However, what was important is that they found that uh, directly related to vitamin B1 activity was the buildup of plaques in the brain that lead to Alzheimer's disease in humans, and also the degree of poor utilization of sugar and lacking uh, uh, vitamin B1 activity was related to memory loss in, the, um, in these rodents with Alzheimer's disease, and that benfotiamine was reversing it. So thiamine deficiency, vitamin B1 deficiency, has been, in link, has been linked in studies to increased beta amyloid production. Uh, these are cell studies. But also the plaque buildup in the brains of animals. So these are the plaques that build up in the brains of animals with Alzheimer's disease. And humans, humans too. So these are pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, you know, the damage that's occurring in Alzheimer's disease. And they can be reversed by thiamine supplementation, suggesting that thiamine could be protective in Alzheimer's disease. So don't go away. We're going to read studies in a minute. Now, other conditions, other disorders, uh, like mitochondrial dysfunction. Your mitochondria are your power plants in your cells. Your cells are loaded with these things that convert sugar and oxygen into energy. So mitochondrial dysfunction is, is predicated on that. And also chronic oxidative stress, the opposite of antioxidants, where things like radiation and toxins are, or, or byproducts of energy metabolism are killing your cells. There's not sufficient antioxidants to prevent the death of memory cells are linked to a lack of thiamine. So lacking thiamine leads to greater oxidation in the brain and the death of brain cells and also to the damage and the worsening of the brain in Alzheimer's disease. Now, presently, there is only slight but very inconsistent evidence that a regular thiamine supplement is beneficial to the brains of Alzheimer's patients. A small double-blind placebo-controlled study reported no beneficial effect, zero beneficial effect of 3,000 milligrams a day of thiamine, that's a huge dosage, on the rate of cognitive decline over a 12-month period in patients with Alzheimer's. Didn't do anything. A preliminary report from another study claimed a mild benefit of up to eight grams of thiamine a day, which is an incredibly high dosage. It's like over a, it's like a teaspoon and a half of thiamine. That's a huge dosage. Uh, that was in dementia of the Alzheimer's type. But once again, that's massively high. A systematic review of randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials of thiamine in patients with uh, uh, diseases of the Alzheimer's type found no evidence that thiamine was a useful treatment for the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. But research is showing 
that benfotiamine may actually help. So let's go to the studies. First of all, there's a, a report from Weill Cornell Medical College, their Department of Neuro Neurology and Neuroscience, published in the journal Molecular Cellular Neuroscience. And they found that, uh, according to Weill Cornell, that, um, hey, th this really is an issue. Lacking vitamin B1 function in the brain is definitely connected to brain diseases like you would see in, in uh, berry. Berry is one of them that can affect the heart and the brain, et cetera, and the nervous system. Another one is uh, wernicke korsakoff syndrome that you see in alcoholics. That diseases of the brain are linked to damage to uh, vitamin B1 metabolism or lacking vitamin B1. And so is diabetes, diabetes of the body where diabetics cannot use blood sugar for energy. And they're seeing the same thing in Alzheimer's disease patients that uh, there's accruing brain damage linked to poor function of vitamin B1 and strongly connected with that is the inability to, to use the sugar in the brain for energy. So that's why Cornell, you know, uh, Ivy League, okay? So here's two recent studies where they're giving Alzheimer's disease patients benfotiamine. The first one is from a number of academic research institutions throughout China, like the Pet Center in Hushan Hospital in China. Now, the Pet Center isn't like, like, like pet bunny rabbits. It's pet scans of the brain. And the Department of Neurology, State Key Laboratory of Medical Neurobiology. This is, these are like major institutions in China that do brain research. It's in the Journal of Neuroscience Bulletins. It's a small study. And they gave people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease benfotiamine capsules, 300 milligrams total a day for a year and a half. And they were examining them with PET scans. And they found that in the patients given the benfotiamine, 300 milligrams a day for a year and a half, they did better in brain function tests and memory function tests. But also it was really slowing down deterioration it was really slowing down deterioration of their physical and mental function. And they saw in PET scans that the benfotiamine was working better in the brain than regular vitamin B1. They also found, and this was very interesting on the PET scans, that um, uh, benfotiamine improved brain function in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, even if they had plaque in their brain, it didn't matter. Just having that form of B1, benfotiamine in their brain, improve brain function. So here's the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. This is a very recent study from the Brain and Mind Research Institute at Weill Cornell Medicine, Berkey Neurological Institute up in White Plains, New York, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. I want to tell you all these academic research institutions because this gives this study clout plus this peer-reviewed journal, that's a high-quality journal, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, makes this study real. The Department of Neuroscience, Georgetown University down in Washington. The Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain in New York City. The Department of Neurology, Keck School of Medicine at USC, University of Southern California in LA, and Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. They all work together. They all work together, and here's what they said. In preclinical models, now that's animal studies and studies in a test tube or a dish. Benfotiamine, this is their wor wording. In preclinical models, benfotiamine efficiently ameliorates the clinical and biological pathologies that define Alzheimer's disease, including impaired cognition, amyloid beta plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, I'll, I'll translate this to you, and diminished glucose metabolism, oxidative stress, and increased advanced glycation in products, and inflammation. So, in animals, when they give them benfotiamine, everything that's basically going wrong in Alzheimer's disease is being reversed by benfotiamine. It's improving their brain function. It's breaking down the plaques or preventing the buildup of plaques. It's preventing damage to the nerve tissue. That's kind of like the, the, the tail end of Alzheimer's disease where the brain is really getting destroyed. Uh, the ability to utilize uh, sugar in the brain for energy, uh, preventing damage and the death of brain cells and uh, reducing inflammation in the brain. That's powerful statements by very advanced academic research and institutions involved with human brain health. So there's something really to this.
So they did a 12-month study with benfotiamine in people with Alzheimer's disease. A 12-month study. I don't know why this wasn't in the news. This should have been all over the news. I guess with COVID-19, you know, the coronavirus, nothing else is getting on the news. The primary clinical, I'll read you what they say, then I'll translate. The primary clinical outcome was the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, cognitive subscale. That's really uh, a powerful tool for doctors to assess if somebody has dementia or severe memory loss and how bad it is and how quickly it's getting worse, the progression of it. So they gave the patients either placebo or benfotiamine. So the placebo was a capsule that looked like the benfotiamine. And the benfotiamine treatment was safe. Yeah, all the studies show that. And it improved the scale by 43% that Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, the cognitive subscale, that's a powerful tool that the researchers use and the doctors use to assess Alzheimer's disease, how bad it is and how, how quickly it's getting worse, which we call the progression. So benfotiamine improved that scale by 43% compared to the placebo group. And they had less cognitive decline, they were more alert. I mean, it was significant. And they found out that, um, that the rate of function loss, the rate, the rate of brain function loss was slowed down by 77% in the benfotiamine group compared to the placebo group. And benfotiamine was protecting the brain from damage. Here's what they said. Oral benfotiamine, so swallowing a capsule, is safe and potentially efficacious, which means it works, in improving cognitive outcomes among persons with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's disease. So they found giving pain. Now, this is Wild Cornell, and this is Columbia University, and this is Georgetown University, and this is USC, and this is Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I mean, these are high-quality academic research institutions. Uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, too, that giving Alzheimer's disease patients benfotiamine was slowing down their loss of brain function and physical function and improving their brain function over an 18-month period. I don't know if anything else has been that successful. I don't know if there's any drug that's been anywhere near as successful as that. I mean, in the last 100 drugs that they've been developing, they've all been rejected. I think there's one drug that's a little bit promising on the radar right now. It'll take years before it's available for patients with Alzheimer's. Is it as good as this product that doesn't even require a prescription that's absolutely safe? Who knows? They're not going to say that. Are you kidding me? There's billions of dollars in that drug. Um, so here's the thing. In mild cognitive impairment patients, um, uh, benfotiamine has reduced a deterioration of their brain in human clinical trials and improve their brain function. And in patients with mild Alzheimer's disease, the same thing. It slowed down loss of brain function and physical function, and it's actually improved their brain function over quite a long time, a, a, a year and a half. I mean, and, uh, as Alzheimer's goes, that's a major gain. That's a major goalpost that they just passed. Um, so here's my recommendation if you're just older. Get a benfotiamine capsule, 200 milligrams, and take one a day with your breakfast. And if you're diabetic, maybe you're better off with one twice a day, one with breakfast, one with lunch. You take it with food because it's absorbed better with food. Now, what about you have a relative with mild Alzheimer's? Give the 200 milligrams twice a day. Tell the doctor and the nurse. Not fear not to. They need to know about this. In any event... Um, thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, or you could follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Invite Health. Um, thank you for listening, and please listen again in a future episode of, of the Invite Health Podcast. Jerry Hickey signing off. Music.